You are listening to From Embers, a weekly show on CFRC 101.9 FM about anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas and practice. We are broadcasting from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples on land that has come to be called Kingston, Ontario, Canada because of the thievery and brutality of the Canadian state and its empire-loving parents. From Embers is about fires, some real and some metaphorical. Fires started generations ago and tended to over the years. Little sparks all across this territory that we hope will grow, spread, and engulf the thieving state called Canada and the capitalist system that has plagued this land since the fur trade. On this episode of From Embers, we're sharing an interview with the author of a zine called The Pet Guide, New Communication Infrastructure for Anarchists. The Pet Guide is a broad discussion of secure digital communication tools from an anarchist perspective, including a critique of the most popular digital tool for anarchists in so-called North America right now, which is of course the Signal app, and argues that we should all consider familiarizing ourselves and experimenting with other apps that utilize peer-to-peer communication, end-to-end encryption, and the Tor network, hence the PET acronym. A friend grabbed me a copy of this scene at an anarchist book fair this summer, and I really appreciated the accessibility with which the ideas were presented, the funny cartoons used to illustrate certain points, and the focused and concise arguments contained in the text. If you can print and read this text in its zine form, I highly recommend it. It's a very nice experience. Digital copies can be found on It's Going Down by searching New Communication Infrastructure for Anarchists. I felt the questions raised in the zine are important ones for anarchists to consider and had a few extra questions of my own, which led to this interview. We discuss Signal and its critics, metadata surveillance, data brokers, the internet shutdowns in Iran, pros and cons of alternatives such as Briar and Kutch, convenience versus security, mesh networks, and more. I hope you enjoy this conversation. If you want to contact the author, they can be reached on Kutch at an address that is printed in the zine or at pettingzoo at riseup.net. Also check out our show notes to find links to several articles and topics that we cover in the interview. We also do want to hear what you think, so shoot us an email anytime at fromembers at riseup.net. I'm just an anarchist, um, and I'm interested in the way anarchists are using technology and uh, tools and how they can do so safely. So I, I wrote this piece, The Pet Guide, about pet chat apps, and it's also a lot talks a lot about Signal. And what does PET stand for? It's peer-to-peer, encrypted, and Tor. So yeah, it's apps that are peer-to-peer using encryption and, and messaging over Tor. So I don't know. I made up an acronym to keep it a little bit simpler, to put those three ideas to, three ideas together. You know, security is a, is a very large topic, so it's good to be specific about what is sort of being covered in this conversation. So do you want to start by just naming a few things that are sort of outside the, the scope of this particular discussion, but are also important? Yeah, so this is really just about, um, like, the security around, like, electronic chat apps like on your phone or your computer it's not about securing those devices otherwise Um, so like operational security or like opsec around how you use your devices what you use them for Um, it doesn't like i'm not really going to talk about like security culture which is more like the idea of like best practices for operational security i don't think we're going to talk about like what threat modeling is or how to like decide on your threat model um, that's really outside the scope. This is very like targeted and those things are really important. Like it doesn't matter if you're using a really good secure text app, if your device isn't secured or like if there's a key logger on your device reading everything you type into it. Right. So 
that's really important to keep to keep in mind. And just um, before we go any further, do you have any like guides or online resources that do cover those topics that you could point people towards if they are interested in, you know, learning more about how key loggers work or security culture, that kind of thing? There, there's lots online, obviously. Um, a really good one recently that I saw is, um, and I can't, like, I'm not going to s- totally vouch for any anything here. Like, you know, these are something that I saw and thought that looks, that looks pretty cool. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But there's a, a zine. Um, the site is Riot Medicine, I think, and they have, like, an OPSEC zine. So it's, it's opsec.riotmedicine.net. And that's a really good, like, overview of operational security for, like, demos or activist contexts. I know Crime Think has a few good articles. There's uh, one I would highlight that's, like, a guide to crossing the U.S. border. Um, I think they also have a bunch of, like, they call them, like, pop sec articles that are, like, they take a movie and then talk about the movie plot to, like, explain operational security. They're a little bit older. I'm not sure if they're, like, uh, still relevant, but... um, and there's a website called Privacy Guides, which I just saw recently, but it looks quite good. And it covers an intro to like threat modeling, a lot of di- different kind of digital security basics um, and a lot of recommendations, which again, I, I don't know if I would necessarily endorse the recommendations, but it's a really good resource. It's uh, privacyguides.org. So I know you talk in the zine about Signal and some critiques or limitations of Signal, um, and just in case anyone listening hasn't really used Signal, can you kind of give, um, if you could make it even like a personal story of like how Signal grew in your life or how Signal became so widely adopted among anarchists and now beyond circles? Yeah, I mean, my my own personal story with Signal. Um, <laughs> I mean, I remember, so I remember hearing about TechSecure, which was like the precursor project to Signal, which was like encrypted SMS messages, like it would just encrypt regular text messages. But I couldn't use it because I didn't have an Android phone. I think the first smartphone I had was probably an iPhone. It wasn't available for iPhone. Um, But I kind of knew like, you know, the nerdier people I knew would have been using that on their like Android phone. And even then, I remember that part of the kind of like legitimacy, I guess, of the project was because people had an, an in real life kind of web of trust with the the primary developer um, of that project, which is Moxie Marlin Spike, who then went on to like essentially like build signals, like the main the main developer. Um, and I think, yeah, the I remember, yeah, I got a signal became available for more more um, platforms, and I definitely started using it to talk to other anarchists or people who were like a little bit of like the you know wing that privacy type who would use that kind of app but yeah it's like i think everyone has the experience now of like in the past 10 or five four years like kind of everyone they know uses signal i think a lot of people i know would be like oh it used to be how i talked to my drug dealer or something funny like that and now it's like how i talk to my mom um yeah totally like that's what kind of everyone says which is which is interesting like it's totally become a ubiquitous um just kind of in general the general world at least in like uh North America. I know that it can be a little bit different in other parts of the world where other other similar apps are more dominant, but yeah. I remember certain watershed moments in recent years around um, revelations about WhatsApp uh, privacy policy changes and stuff like that causing these huge floods of people deciding en masse to kind of like migrate over to Signal. Um, those were certain moments that I've noticed, yeah, like a bunch of people in my phone from work or sort of non-political contacts all started suddenly popping up. This person's on signal. This person's on signal. Yeah. And in fact, one of those incidents, like the WhatsApp thing, I believe is when so many people downloaded signal and started using it in such a short order that it like crashed their, their server capacity. They couldn't, couldn't handle the new users. And like another sort of debate that I remember that I think is relevant to this discussion, because it sort of circles back is people were really debating like Signal versus uh, PGP email encryption as a way of communicating. And I'm not super technical, but my understanding of that debate was really just about like ease of use was a lot of it came down to like Signal is is easier to use and uh, sort of marketed for mass adoption where PGP can be quite technical and 
Um, even though it's become easier over the years, it, it's like pretty easy to, to lose your key or your key expires. And I just, I found personally in my life, a lot of people that I've tried to get on PGP, maybe stay on for six months and then lose a password and then it no longer works. And I think that's been the experience of a few people I know. Everyone's been to that workshop where they learned how to use PGP in their email and then installed it and then never used it again. <laughs> Everyone has that, <laughs> yeah. that story. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely true. And for sure, like, I mean, um, you know, before we get into any, like, if we're going to talk about like critiques of Signal or something like, for sure, Signal is really good. I think it's great. I don't think people should just like stop using Signal or something like that. Like that isn't meant to be the point of of the piece or what I'm trying to talk about necessarily. It's a net good that it's encouraged so many people to like use encrypted communication made it very easy. And a lot of that is like addressing like those things, like it just does like the key management part really well and the exchange and all that stuff is just kind of like handled in a seamless way. There are like problems with that where it makes it so people don't fully appreciate or understand implications of how that can like not work or be um, put them at risk if they're like not using it properly. But I mean, overall they do like the people who do signal have done like probably the best job of any other like project in terms of making it both quite effective and safe and also really easy to use. Like that's just like, I think is true. So like, that's like a front load for any like critique that might come later or something. Yeah. And like, I've been a part of efforts and, and know other people who spent a lot of time trying to get people on signal. Uh, and it, and it, and it was pretty as a broad thing. It's a, it's a very successful project. So I guess I'm wondering what, prompted you to want to look outside of Signal or explore these alternatives and, and ultimately write this text about it? Well, because I've just heard, you know, I've heard people talk about, you know, the problems with Signal or like their grievances. Um, and for certain like threat models or use cases, like the, the phone number, having to register your account with a phone number is, is a problem or like a challenge. Um, so that's like one impetus for like finding alternatives. And then just also like, I've been in those conversations where people are like either have like a, you know, serious concern about it for this or that reason, whether it's technical or um, political or something like that in terms of like, you know, the signal foundation or where their funding comes from. And we can talk about all that stuff, but like, I've been in those conversations and that makes me curious about like, like I said, I'm interested in, you know, digital tools and technology and like encryption and stuff and like what the best tool is. And like, for me, I want to like, I'm not like able to fully understand all the like math of encryption and stuff like that, but I like to try and research and figure out like what is the best solution for different use cases or like try and try and parse it all out. Um, and I'm always trying to keep tabs on like other projects like that could be useful, like other other apps, other tools, um, and see where they're at and like figure out like you know what what challenges are they addressing. And so I really wanted to do like a profile of these other other apps because I saw niche and, and with other people, you know, other anarchists that I like talk to basically through apps, you know, we were like, oh, these are interesting. I might address like certain challenges we have or issues we have with signal or concerns we have, but then wanting to write about them and profile them, it really became necessary to like kind of talk about signal just because that's like the, the counterpoint. And I mean, that ended up taking like quite a bit of, of energy and space, but I think it's, I think it's useful. Yeah. And, and, and part of it is like when Moxie left signal, like this is how, like this was at the start of the year, um, start of 2022 and, and it's going down, had a piece about it kind of saying that um, signal is fine. Like don't abandon signal because Moxie's left, you know, but there was a kind of like an examination of the critiques and being like, most of these are like, dismissible conspiracy theories or, or whatever. Like there's not a lot of, of credence to some of these like concerns about signal that are a little bit like out there, but we have to be vigilant. We have to pay attention to like where these tools are in our lives, like how they're being integrated into like our movements or whatever, like how we rely on them maybe too much and be critical of that relationship, I guess, with the tools and also how they work, like what, what threat models or like use cases are they actually applicable for and which are they not maybe. So I was like, okay, I'm going to be critical. I'm going to deep dive on this and, and look at the alternatives and then try and explain it all. What do you say to, to people whose critiques are more of that 
sort of conspiracy level critique where they point out that there's some U.S. government funding has gone to the Signal Foundation or even positing that the whole thing is like a CIA op to gather information, blah, blah, blah. What do you say when that comes up? I don't want to get too into it because it could get really long, but I, I, I kind of like looked at all the different claims and like mainly it boils down to like the, the funding sources for Signal, which, I mean, I explained in the piece like, you know, this funding comes from like the Open Technology Fund that comes from a U.S. government, like essentially like propaganda department, um, like soft power department or whatever. Um, and so there's like this like line you can draw to be like, well, the money comes from the U.S. government, from the U.S. State Department. So clearly it's like some kind of op. And it's 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 just like very easy to like look at how that thing actually works, that like mountain of of funding uh that the u.s government puts out to like maintain dominance and like many many governments many like state powers in the world do similar things with their you know money and influence to try and like create projects that will advance their political interests abroad or whatever um by like destabilizing their their rivals or so on right um that money funds like tons of stuff it ends up like trickling down into all kinds of projects um, maybe there are like ethical concerns, maybe like projects shouldn't take money from sources like that, or should be more careful about sources. And like, obviously we should scrutinize where money comes from for like all these kinds of like open source apps and tools and stuff. But it just, it doesn't mean that there's like a back door. Like if, if you look at the way Signal is built, it's like open source. It's, it's a super high profile project. Everyone's looking at the code to see if it's secure like experts, people that, you know, are in cryptography, they're trying to find bugs and mistakes, not even like backdoors, right? They're just looking for like bugs, let alone a, you know, gaping backdoor. Um, and we already know how those kinds of adversaries will target um, groups of people they're targeting. It isn't, it isn't by hiding a backdoor in the most like easy to spot and obvious place, right? They do with corporations like who are complicit or they'll like target and put malware on your phone, like Pegasus, which is like the NSO group malware that's been um, cropping up on all kinds of activists and journalists phones around the world. You know, there is like a good example of this happening in real life. Like, I guess I could talk about like the, the An Anom um, app or like phone that like the FBI put together. It's like it's called operation Trojan shield. And they like actually did create a, encrypted phone that was like sold to like drug dealers and like the FBI was running the networks so that could just collect all the information on it. Like we know what that looks like, right? We have like an example of that actual conspiracy happening. Um, and there's just so many like ways to see how it's different from something like Signal. But if you look at the claims, the Signal being like a CIA op or something, it all traces back to like where the funding came from. And that isn't a secret. The government, the US government is like, yeah, this is the money we spend on all this stuff because funding things like Tor, things like Signal, things like Tails, it empowers and encourages dissidents to like act against their governments, which are rivals of the United States. That is like very simple, like foreign policy. It's not like you don't need a conspiracy there. And they're like, they're open about it. It's not like a secret. Yeah, and like it's a it's a meta topic for this whole discussion, but I think so many of these questions come down to like how do we especially those like me who are not I'm not reading code and uh I'm not auditing signals code on my own time or something. I can't I don't have the skills to do that. So how does someone get to the point where they end up trusting something? How does that construct it either through endorsements or you've got the one friend who's just really technically savvy who does all the hard research and then says use this and with i think your point about signal being so high profile and probably you know the fact that it has been third party audited so much that makes me feel pretty good about it i don't know it's just an interesting question about how how people come to trust this software that they don't really understand yeah i think it is a really i mean it is a really tricky thing because it's like especially like as anarchists, like anarchists, we don't want to be like, oh, we're going to appeal, we have to appeal to experts to tell us what, you know, what is good or not. Like that's, you know, like that's not something that I personally want to do is be like, oh, you have to trust me or you have to trust this expert or I have to trust this expert. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it's like not necessarily possible to like fully 
for every individual to fully understand like all the code and cryptography and everything that goes into these kinds of tools. So that definitely is like an interesting like meta question. Um, and that's part of why like, so like looking at the actual project that's like building the app, like and what their motivations are and what it like looking at what their funding is, you know, are they, are they a private company? Are they trying to be bought, right? Is it like a startup that's trying to be bought by a bigger company? The people making it, like what are their motivations? Like that's important to me. Um, and then like I do, you know, I have like people that I will talk to who I trust who have like expertise in this kind of stuff that I'll like ask about, you know, like, oh, I have the concern about Signal and how it could be spied on, like, is this valid or not? And they'll explain it to me in terms I understand and I trust them, I guess. And a lot of people do, you know, if you look at a lot of people auditing the code, like they all kind of agree, there's like a consensus in a group, like, I value that kind of like consensus based trust, I guess, if it's like a large group of like trustworthy people who all have a consensus about something being probably trustable because they're experts about it. I, I do also think like, and that's part of like um, wanting to talk about this stuff is like, I think it is important to, for people to feel like empowered to like try and learn about it a bit. Like you don't have to become a total expert in like the cryptographic protocol that Signal uses to like, get there but you can you can spend some time like engaging with how it works like how what are the concerns um with a centralized service like signal versus something decentralized like the other apps that i that i want to talk about right like i just think compared to like how people used to engage with technology like now we are much more just like users passive users of a lot of these things and people are discouraged from trying to like understand how they actually work so yeah, I mean, like I, I'm with you. I, I trust the cryptography and the protocol. So assuming we can do that, and the quantum computers aren't, you know, there to yeah, well, that's a whole break everything thing. in between. <laughs> let's. <laughs> I think we can we can shelf that and and move to the like. What are the, even though the cryptography is solid, what are the issues that are raised in the zine with uh, with signals infrastructure? Yeah, there's there's three main points. Um, one is that signal. It's it's really like a centralized service. It relies on centralized server infrastructure. And it's like a it's a service. It's not really just a standalone app. Um, and then it also requires your account to have a phone number. Like you have to use a phone number to sign up. Every account is linked to a like real phone number. So that's like a thing. Um, and there's also like a cryptocurrency payment system built into Signal, which I think a lot of people don't even know about, or like it's easy to miss. Um, but I think that's a concern as well. What's your opinion on the crypto thing? Does it bother you? I think the biggest the biggest problem with the crypto, like there's lots of critiques of just like cryptocurrency stuff in general and how it, you know, like is it a pyramid scheme some sure. of it or whatever and Web3 and the metaverse and all this, all this bullshit, like all that aside, like just in a practical argument, like they want it to be a payment platform where you can send money to each other on Signal. And if if that is something that happens where people are like ubiquitously in the United States sending money like cryptocurrency untraceably back and forth on signal, I mean, that would be cool, but for sure that is going to result in a much greater adversarial relationship, I guess, between signal and like the U S government, which is the government of the country where signal is like based, like they're under that jurisdiction. Right. So like, and, and the U S government is already like, cracking down on cryptocurrency stuff and like trying to regulate it really heavily, partly because of fraud and um, effects on the like economy, but also because of like crime. Like it's just like really just useful for crime, like because you can anonymously send money. Signal is for us anarchists, it's like a critical infrastructure for like secure communication. And it just is like a very obvious like practical concern that if it becomes like juicy target because it's being used to like send money anonymously for all kinds of crime all the time like that's just not going to fly with the u.s government like something will come to a head there so that's like the the biggest concern in the text you wrote that you know signal can be best understood as a as a service almost more than an app in terms of the centralized server infrastructure that it uses to transmit messages and files and pictures and all that. Can you sort of explain what that is and why you're critical of it? So yeah, it's like Signal 
on its own, like the application on your phone or on your computer, it can't do anything by itself. It, it doesn't. It does. Does really doesn't do anything. It has to like. It's just something that talks to the the signal server, like the signal servers. It's really like a you know big cloud of of servers and Amazon warehouse somewhere. But yeah, so it's like it's really just a service that the Signal Foundation provides, where they're like, you have a little app that connects to their server. It lets you talk to your friends. It lets you send messages, but it it doesn't do anything. Like the app on your phone does nothing on its own. Um, so really, it's like a chat service that you just get to use for free. Um, and like most chat apps are like that. I mean, when you think about it, like you you have the app on your phone, but it does nothing on its own. It's even just like a phone, like an analog phone or whatever. Like the phone on it by itself does nothing. You can't talk to your friend on the phone. You need like the phone company. You need like Bell or whatever, right? To like route your call to your friend. So like that's a service really. It, the, the phone itself is nothing. It's just like part of the service. So Signal is like that. And I think that's a really important point because we think of it mostly as like this little app that's on my phone that lets me talk directly to my friend, but that's not what it is. It's like a whole, it's a whole service. The problem with that is like, one is that there's security concerns. So like a central service is like more easily attacked. Like if someone wants to see what's happening on the users of that service, they just have to attack like a central point because it's the centralized service. They can just go to the signal server um, the analogy I use in the in the text is like a postal service. They can go to the post office, and they can see all the mail coming in and out. They just have to go to one place. The other thing is like servers are going to see a lot of metadata, so not the contents of messages, but like who's sending messages to who, when they're sending messages, you know, who's using the service. Like that's a problem with services. It's like very easy to like attack the service, or the service itself will see a lot of metadata. And then the other issue is like. Um, you have to trust the service. You have to trust that the service is like being um, not not being a bad actor. Like it's being honest about what it is or is not doing um, in its facilitating your connection with your friend. Um, and I think the last one is just that you're you're reliant on that service. Like if the service goes down, you're out of luck, right? If signals servers go down, like in whatever, January 2021, when everyone from WhatsApp was joining Signal at once, you're out of luck, like Signal doesn't work. Um, you're dependent on the service provider. So I think it's just a really easy way to think about a lot of problems, potential problems with Signal or concerns, I guess, at once, once you realize that it is this like central service. Yeah, and, I, and you know, you make the point that Signal has, has encrypted a lot of that metadata on their service, except for a few um, basic, uh, identifiers, but that you have to sort of trust that that is the code that they continue to run and that they're not being, um, tampered with through subpoenas or bad actors or whatever. Which, which, yeah. And that's, that's true. Like, again, like I said, signal has been very, very like groundbreaking, maybe like very creative in terms of like applying cryptography, which I don't understand, but I like read things written by people who do understand so you know you have to take this all with a grain of salt but i think it is pretty reliable that um signal is like very good at creatively employing cryptography to make it so that their service the signal server is is not really even able to collect very much information about users like the really when they when they do um reply to subpoenas for user data the only thing they can really say is the that a certain phone number has an account and the last time the account connected to the service. And I think also the date the account was created, um, which is not very much information. It's not nothing, but it's really not very much. And that is a testament to signals like um, deployment of cryptography to like create a, a service that is quite good at respecting users' privacy. However, like yeah, we have to trust that the signal server is behaving the way we're told. There's no good reason to think that it's not. Like, I really want to stress, like, I don't want, you know, like, to incite some <laughs> wave of panic about it. Like, there's no reason to not. It's a big, you know, high-profile thing. We would, people would, people would know. It would be very hard for that to happen. But it's it's a concern, right? I think I talk about three three possible examples just to, like, speculate, which is, like, I think... I don't want to be like, this has happened, panic. 
but just like these are plausible things. Like the law could change in the US, think about the crypto stuff, and Signal could be compelled to either collect or disclose more information. Um, and that could happen without public knowledge, right? Or Signal could just decide that for ethical reasons, they don't necessarily want to be as protective of user privacy. Um, like that could be political, you know, political decision, like whatever people are using Signal for, maybe Signal decides that they actually don't want to support that. Or Signal could just be hacked, right, um, by an adversary. Again, there's no reason I think any of these things have happened. I think they're all very unlikely that they have happened. They're not necessarily plaus uh, probable, but they could happen and it's like a concern. And the reason that these things are like applicable is because it's a central service where it's like one thing that could be can be attacked. The thing about Signal being a centralized service and again, preface with like Signal is very good at um, obfuscating metadata to the greatest extent possible. Metadata being like data about the data. So like not the contents of a message that's very well protected with end-to-end -end encryption through the like transmission of your messages, but like who's sending messages to who and when and like how big the messages are and you know where you are when you're sending the message and what device you're using, all that kind of stuff is metadata. And like everything we do online generates tons and tons and tons and tons of metadata. Like every app you use, everywhere your phone goes with you, like when your phone is on and off, like all of that is metadata. And that is being increasingly like used to like, first of all, target us for like marketing, but that's like, you know, not the focus here. It's being used to like target people that are like, you know, targets of our adversaries, like, you know, and the quote in the, in the, the piece is like from this like talk from the like, former NSA director and CIA director. And he's like, we kill people based on metadata. You know, like they drone strike people based on metadata. A good, a good piece that came out recently is like the, the US military has been buying tons of location data from like a bunch of apps that are like Muslim prayer apps and like mobile Quran, you can like download on your phone, but like millions of people in the world use these apps. And the US military is just buying all the user data and then literally using it to like target drone strikes on people, right? This is like, you know, this is happening. Um, so worrying about metadata is really important. Signal's doing a really good job at like protecting us from like leaking metadata out into the world, but there is still gonna be metadata. And like, the fact is that like, this is how a lot of adversaries are targeting um, people or like finding people that they want to target is using metadata because they can't see into messages anymore. Like encryption has like ruined that ability. Like they can't wiretap anything online because it's all encrypted through HTTPS or like end-to-end -end encryption. Like, you know, even WhatsApp has end-to-end -end encryption now like Signal. So the only way they can do anything is by like using metadata and they can do a lot. Like they have really powerful tools to correlate all this data, metadata that we're generating and de-anonymize people um, you know, track networks of people, like see trends, like that's the kind of stuff they're doing. A lot of this like links into like, you know, the idea of like big data and like kind of like machine learning or like AI. So that's part of the like concern with Signal being a central service is like, it's more easily targeted by that kind of analysis. Do you want to talk about that example of the, uh, that Catholic priest on Grindr? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good example. Um, I mean, basically, it's just like the idea is that even like any adversary, like anybody out there, like investigative journalists, like local law enforcement all over the world, like, if they want to leverage all this metadata, they can just buy it from like, data brokers, like people who are, you know, all these apps are collecting this data. They need to make money. They just sell their anonymized, quote unquote, anonymized user data to like these brokers who have like collected from all these different sources and scrape it online and put into big databases and analyze it. And then they will sell that to anybody. So you can like go and be like, I want to know, um, you know, I want to know about this particular phone. Like what anonymized, quote unquote, data do you have associated with this phone that I happen to already know who owns that phone. So I'm going to now de-anonymize the data that you give me because I know whose phone it is, right? So like the funny story that I mentioned in the in the zine is this like big 
I mean, in the Catholic world, I think it was a big news story where some um, like Catholic investigative journalist, like Catholic newspaper, like must have had a bone to pick with this like head bishop guy in the U.S. and like bought a bunch of uh, data from a data broker that basically came from Grinder and like correlated it with a few other data sets that they were able to get from other data brokers and like had a consultant help them and basically were like his phone that we know is his phone has like used Grinder at like his house and like his workplace, like the places where we know it's him because it's his house and then his office and then his uh, other office and then his cottage or whatever. And so they're like outed him as a Grinder user, um, <laughs> like because they just got this data. It's just an example of like, it's very, very easy for even like a, you know, scumbag Catholic investigative journalist who wants to smear this chief bishop to like, you know, sorry? No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, it's very trivial to some extent. And so, you know, Signal is doing a lot to protect our meta metadata, but in this world where it's such a big issue um, in terms of like how it can be like leveraged to like de-anonymize somebody who's like otherwise trying to be anonymous online or like, correlate activity between different people or like map networks, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's just like really underlines how important it is to be like very vigilant. And these pet apps, part of the reason they're engineered the way they are is to specifically uh, mitigate this exact problem of like metadata generation. You're listening to From Embers, airing first on CFRC 101.9 FM in Kingston and podcasting online at fromembers.libsyn.com. We're halfway through my discussion with the author of The Pet Guide, New Communication Infrastructure for Anarchists, which contains a broad discussion of secure digital communication tools from an anarchist perspective. You can find the text online at It's Going Down by searching New Communication Infrastructure for Anarchists or checking our show notes. The author can be reached at PettingZoo at RiseUp.net or via Kutch at the address printed in the zine. We at From Embers also want to hear what you think, so shoot us an email anytime at FromEmbers at RiseUp.net. Can you explain sort of how a peer-to-peer, -peer, the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of these other applications um, differentiates them from Signal? Yeah, so this is why it's important or useful to use the idea of like a service like for these centralized things like Signal. So a peer-to-peer -peer system, which the other apps that I talk about in the, in the zine, like Briar and Kutch, are peer-to-peer. -peer. So it means that you're directly communicating with your peer, your friend, the person you're talking to. There's no central service mediating it. To go back to the analogy of like a telephone, it's like instead of a telephone, it's like a ham radio. Like you have the radio, your friend has a radio. They talk directly to each other. There's no like provider company, third party that has to be involved. So you're not relying on a central service to be up. You're not trusting a central service with your, your data. All you're using is like the infrastructure of the internet in terms of a route from you to your to your friend, which there are concerns about the infrastructure of the internet, but those concerns apply to signal any other like internet app we would talk about, right? So, you know, we can kind of remove that from the equation because that applies to everything that we're talking about in this conversation. In terms of these peer-to-peer uh, -peer encrypted Tor apps, um, there's this issue that comes up and is discussed fairly at length in the zine of synchronous versus asynchronous communication. Can you explain that? Yeah. And I think, yeah, because this is like a usability thing that can throw off a lot of people. So the the idea of like synchronous communication is like the way we're talking right now, like we're having a conversation, we're both connected on signal, on a signal call, and we're like actively exchanging, you know, messages with each other in terms of talking. Um, that's like synchronous. Asynchronous would be like, you send me a list of interview questions and then I answer them and send you the answers back, like with a time delay, right? That would be like asynchronous. Um, and these days we're pretty used to like a mix of both, but the way most like 
messaging platforms we use in terms of like all the different like you know messengers and text messages and and all that kind of stuff like it's it's mostly asynchronous like mostly we send messages back and forth without an expectation that the other person is is synchronous there are like social expectations that you have to like answer a text right away or whatever but in terms of the technology like the text will be text message or whatever will be delivered no matter what whether the other person is online or not the trick with peer to peer is because there's no third party there's no central server to store and relay messages so like you and the person you want to talk to both have to be like online and connected with each other for messages to be exchanged there's no like mailbox where you can just leave a letter for your friend you have to give it to them directly right so that's kind of the issue and it can be jarring because we're so used to having this like ability to message anyone we know through like five to ten different platforms and they don't even have to be online and they'll get the message eventually right like that's just we're just so accustomed to that but with these peer-to-peer apps with briar and kutch for the most part you both have to be online and connected in order to exchange messages and that can be it's just it can just be jarring because of what we're so used to yeah i don't know how old you are but i i used msn messenger and icq and stuff a lot when i was growing up and uh that's referenced in the zine and i i appreciated it as an example of like it's kind of like you got to be logged in and online to talk um but given that things are not like that anymore like do you think that's a deal breaker or non-starter for a lot of people i mean it might be i try to make the case part of the reason i try to explain it again it's like understanding how these things work i think like is empowering right so like if you understand that the reason you have this convenience in all of your the majority of your like communication mediums that we have like access to today the reason we have that convenience is because we're relying on this third party and that has serious consequences for like security and privacy and reliability right so i want people to think about that and like learn about how the system of communication they're using works and understand those those consequences um but also i try to like pitch like yeah this can seem like a drag if you want to use one of these apps and it has to be this like synchronicity is important but also it can be it can be like kind of cool like it can be nice like you have to be intentional about talking to someone on one of these apps you have to like set a particular time when you're going to talk or like make a date on a different platform right like if you see someone out in the world and you say hey i'll be on i'll be on briar later like we should we should chat more you know there or you can you know you can set up an appointment like you can be talking on signal and say hey let's go chat on kutch like here you know i'll be there in an hour or whatever i'll be online um which is what people used to do with you know icq and msn messenger if listeners remember like you know it depends on the age i feel like younger people i, I don't know what a, i don't know what an, an analogy or like a example would be that would work but it's a little bit like phone calls i guess how a phone call can be nice in terms of the synchronicity can actually be and the intentionality to like setting up a phone call where you're like, I'm going to be available to chat with you. Like we just set up this phone call today and we're both, we're like agreed on a time. We'll both be available and we're fully intentionally present and available to each other to like have this conversation, like encouraging that kind of interaction can just be nice. Socially, I think anarchists might appreciate the value and all that. So that's part of the like totally. <laughs> trying to like counter counterbalance the tough sell of uh, usability of, of people who might be really used to the convenience of like asynchronous communication. Yeah. And the like semi distracted multitasking that is modern life. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, I totally agree with you. I just, I think about like how a lot of people don't even talk on the phone anymore. You yeah. know, like it's, yeah. it is a battle. It's a, it's a, it's a cultural tension. And then the other aspect of the PET, I think encryption is common to both uh, Signal and uh, and these apps, uh, but the T is is for Tor. Um, so why is the fact that these apps use the Tor network to relay messages so important? Essentially, like the Tor network is a like very large network that's run by like lots of different people, and it provides a very very robust way to anonymously connect two points across the internet in terms of like nobody who makes the tor network can know who's talking to each other and nobody like watching 
internet traffic can know who's talking to each other. All you can see is that this person is using Tor. And so these pet apps, the T is for Tor, like they route all of their traffic through Tor automatically. I'm sure a lot of anarchists are like familiar with Tor in terms of being encouraged to use it for, for browsing on the internet. It's also like crucial for people who live in like um, countries where there's any kind of internet censorship. It's like a really one of the most reliable ways to like get around internet censorship. But it can be hard to set up, especially if you're trying to like route like your chat app through Tor. You could route Signal through Tor, but it's like quite technical to set up. These apps is just like automatic. You run the app, it's running through Tor. Like your messages are going to go through Tor in the sense that Signal kind of brought the end-to-end -end encryption like to really usable. I, I feel like Briar and Kutch are bringing Tor for like messaging like to the level of like it's very usable like you don't have to like exchange your keys and like you know all the stuff you learn in a workshop for pgp in 2003 or whatever so the two apps that you chose to focus on were briar and kutch uh why did you pick them up i mean these are just the two that are the most functional like i mean there's a couple apps and projects that are like working in this direction or like variously trying to combine these like three um, features and I knew about Briar for a while and had been like following the project as they were like adding features um, and I had been like encouraging anarchists to like check it out or like talk about how it might be useful or compare to Signal or whatever or address people who had concerns about Signal um, and then I also heard about Kutch probably in, in just like generally researching this kind of stuff but really they're just the two that are like almost or have arrived in terms of being like usable like they're like you know um you can use them to talk to people it works so they're like ready for prime time and i've i've used briar on and off for several years and i i, I found it to be a pretty good useful app for uh, for communicating with people that you've sort of prearranged to communicate with over it um but this is the first i've ever heard of kutch is it more like new? Like I noticed in the Play Store, it told me there were 10 plus downloads. 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Kutch is newer. Um, I don't know if I would trust the Play Store because I feel like a lot of the Kutch users are installing it um, directly directly on their phone as okay. an APK. Or um, so like in terms of the two different projects, like Briar is very much like a mobile app for an Android phone. Um, there is a Briar desktop version, but it's like not very far along. It's really just a, a alpha, beta, whatever. It's like not usable. It's just like a proof of concept. It is coming. Like it's a it's a very active project. I think the desktop app will be really cool. On the other side, side Kutch is like has a very functional desktop app as well as an Android app, and I think it's like very practical for like a desktop on any computer. That's kind of like the, the different niche, I guess. But yeah, it is newer, but it's also very, uh, very active or like has had a very active period of development. And the group that's making it, I had also never heard of before, like hearing about the app, but it's pretty cool. It's in Vancouver. Sure. Yeah. I mean, what do you know about the people behind these two projects? Neither of them are like the the kind of like personal web of trust that like people might have with with moxie like i don't personally know know moxie but i like know people who personally know moxie and i think that's true for a lot of a lot of anarchists like there is that kind of web of trust um i don't i don't think i want to say that i like know any of the people in these projects or want to like vote for them personally but in terms of like on paper like looking up their info like both projects have people who are activists anarchists anarchist adjacent um like hackers, privacy or free software enthusiasts, like the people behind the projects are both pretty cool and have pretty admirable goals in terms of like what they want the project to be, both both for Briar and, and Kutch. Aside from the um, uh, synchronicity issue we already talked about, what would be the main difference in the like user experience with Briar or Kutch versus Signal? On the surface, like it's just it's just a chat app. You like add your contacts, you talk to them. Um, you know that's kind of the same as like Signal, but obviously because of all the other things, um, the fact that they're peer to peer and encrypted in Tor, there are a few big differences. We talked about the synchronicity. One thing is like again thinking about like the Signal service, like as a service, 
you know, if you have a signal on your phone and then you get a new phone and you want to like transfer your account, because your account, like all of your contact info, all that stuff can be synced through the signal server, right? Um, so you can just like, you know, I think signal has a has a pin now, which is very good, but like you can just like there's some protection, right? But your your account just gets synced through the cloud. Um, and you can like sync your messages on different devices or like move your account around to a device very easily. These apps, because they're like self-contained on your phone, there's no central service. You can't just sync your account across like multiple devices and you just you kind of like are in charge of your account. Like there's no recovery because there's no like there's no like company to go recover your account from. If you like lose your password, it's that's it. Your account's gone. Your prof like your contacts, your message history, if you've saved it, is toast. So you are a bit more responsible for maintaining that, like keeping track of your password or whatever. There's no backup. Unless you back it up, I guess, yourself. But again, that's a difference. The biggest one maybe is actually that these apps just don't have uh iOS versions, like they won't run on an iPhone. And this is really because of like the way Apple has like built iOS to like not really allow apps to run their own little Tor connections. So that might just be a deal breaker for some people if they're really fixed on using an iPhone. And what about the group chat experience or organizing? That's true too. Um, yeah, group chats are different for sure. And again, that's because normally a group chat and all these things we use for group chats like Signal or, I mean, Instagram, whatever, wherever your group chats live. There's a server that's like handling the group chat, right? It's like taking everyone's messages from the group, holding them and delivering them to when people come online or are connected. Since there's no server, the group chat's going to be a little bit weird and how each app handles it is different. But yeah, if you just think about the idea of synchronicity, like what if everyone in the group isn't online at the same time, that's where things get tricky. If everyone is online and connected in a group chat, it, it works like a group chat. But if people aren't online at the same time, it can get a little bit a little bit weird because when is that user going to get the messages that you were sending while they're offline to the rest of the group who was online, right? Like that you can I, hopefully you understand how that could be like uh, complicated. So with Briar it's like if person X is online, person Y is offline, then person X basically ends up forwarding the message to person Y once they come online. If they're both online at the same time? Yeah, Briar will do a thing where for any of the types of messages it'll send, it'll use mutual contacts so people who are contacts with each other to like relay messages. So we'll never like use a stranger to relay your message. But if you're like mutually a contact with somebody, um, like in a group together, in a group chat together, like the other users will have gotten the group chat messages that you sent while your friend was offline. And then when your friend comes online, if you're offline, the other members of the group can deliver the messages to that friend. But in practice, the timing can be weird. Like you might log mm -hmm. on and get like a whole bunch of messages that you missed depending on who is online and who was online when they were online. This is going to be a problem if you have a really, really big group, basically. Um, right. Because they're not all going to be online at the same time. And who is exchanging messages and how those messages are propagating through like the mesh network of everybody in the group could be weird. And on the flip side, Kutch is trying to do something where if you want to do a group chat, you run your own little server, which is like anyone who's any Kutch user, like any Kutch node or whatever, any Kutch user can become a small server um, to have a group chat or, or group, group chats with their contacts. It's, it's cool. It's, for them, it's an experimental feature is what they call it. So they're like working on finding a way to do that so that even though presumably the person that is like hosting your group chat as like the server is someone you trust, they want it to be like, you don't need to trust that person to the greatest extent possible. So similar to Signal's like very aggressive approach to like creatively employing cryptographic techniques to like, you know, minimize the amount of metadata that like a server has access to or can use. They're doing the same kind of stuff. But in this case, it's like, we're ch we're talking on Kutch and we want to have a quick group chat. I can like become the server for the group chat. And as long as I'm online, I'm going to be like handling the messages um, for the members of the group chat. Where that might go in the future is is interesting. Like you might be able to run 
a community organization, something like that, could run a server um, for their membership in terms of handling their messages. And ideally, that server will be like engineered in such a way that you don't really have to trust the server very much, if at all, in terms of like your your metadata. Obviously, the contents of your message are encrypted, but like, yeah, like your 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 metadata, your identity, your privacy, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's it's an experiment. It's like, a, you know, it's something that they're like researching and developing in in a pretty cool way because like looking at briar like it is a it is a bit of a problem like having a group chat where not everyone is online at the same time is something that is really useful but it's difficult to do in peer-to-peer properly like do safely i guess can you talk a bit about the mesh network capabilities of briar so part of the briar project is like for you know people who want to be able to talk you know privately and securely with encryption for whatever reason, but a lot of their project is also based on like disasters, like after a, a natural disaster or in places where like the internet has gone down or is blocked. Like that's a big part of their interest is like building a functional communica- communication tool for those kinds of scenarios, um, which I think is really interesting and, and relevant, especially like as the you know climate crisis accelerates and you know just many things happening in the world like that is a relevant topic for anybody in the world to think about I think a relevant like uh, situation that they could be prepared for in terms of like using something like Briar the group chats sure maybe it doesn't work great but what Briar does is it also has like um, like blogs and like forums which are kind of like meant for like a larger information kind of transmission network so think about like a, a situation like Iran right now where there's like a big uprising there and the government has like shut down the the internet in various ways, um, like blocked internet access in a bunch of ways. I know that signal has been like blocked and there's been like a cat and mouse game between like signal and, and internet blocking, uh, agency or whatever. So Briar is like, there's a bunch of ways where you can exchange messages. You can exchange messages over Tor, but also over Wi-Fi and also over Bluetooth. If you're like proximal to people with a phone with Briar on it. And if you have contacts, like mutual contacts, like messages can move through that group. Not so much like private messages, but like group chat messages or these like forum posts or like blogs, which is like a little bit how Telegram works. Like Telegram in practice is a lot more like subscribe to a channel and it's more like a broadcast system. The way Briar is building that stuff is is similar, but it can operate without a central internet in terms of like, people are moving around and connecting to each other and to Wi-Fi networks and messages are propagating between them, even though there's no central internet or central internet is, is partially or fully blocked. And that can allow like messages to, to travel through like trusted mutual contacts in terms of like a blog post meant for like a lot of people or a forum discussion. So I think that that is a really interesting part of the application that is like not something that I'm going to use in my everyday life right now, but having that infrastructure on hand could be very useful. And it is, it's very hard to like get that information, but I know it has been like used already in certain parts of the world where there's been like internet shutdown, internet blackout, blocking of other services, even if Tor is being disrupted, right? Because it can like operate just over Wi-Fi if you like want to go that way. Yeah. And I, I really like how you situate this question, not as one of like individual security or convenience but more as a question of like infrastructure i think it's Mm -hmm. it's a really helpful lens through which to kind of talk about this question yeah because i don't think that i don't even want people to to hear this conversation or or read the the zine and think okay i'm going to delete signal like that isn't the goal um it's more just like try using these other apps to add some of your contacts um you know so that you have like that trusted connection with them already and then maybe use it for a, a low stakes project or like to chat with like a certain group of friends in another place or something where you just get used to it. Um, because then when signal is out, like the next time, you know, Elon Musk tweets about it or whatever, you'll have a way to reach your friends that you already like trust. Um, like it's just building a, a, a redundancy infrastructure. Um, and there's like advantages in terms of like, you might find yourself in a situation where you want to use that network instead of signal or we might collectively as like the world find ourselves in a situation where like 
signal is not going to be appropriate because of some like major change. These apps are like independent of like any central service. As long as you have the app working on your phone, you're able to like talk to someone else with the app. And Signal is really good, right? Like Iran is a good example right now. And there's been other examples where um, stuff was going off somewhere. And, you know, Signal, the Signal Foundation was like actively working to make it so that people in those places could like still use Signal, right? It was like helping make Signal a tool in those places. Um, but there might be situations where, for whatever reason, whatever's going on, the jurisdiction that Signal is is bound to in terms of like being based in the United States, they might not be as able or willing to do that, right? Like, they're, it's easy to envision a like situation where the internet is being disrupted in a particular place for a particular reason, and Signal might not be as motivated to play that cat, cat and mouse game that they're playing with like the Iranian government right now. To, to facilitate people to use it. Things can, things can always change and we can't necessarily predict what that change is gonna be. So having like a, a backup that's more resilient, that's more like in our control. If people want to read the text, where can they find it? So it's on It's, on, it's Going Down. Um, the title of the article there is the guide to peer-to-peer encryption and Tor new communication infrastructure for anarchists. And there's there's, um, links there also for like a PDF to read that's like nice and laid out with pictures and then a print a version if you want to print print a zine um, and maybe there'll be a translation or two in the future um, and the last last thing actually that I don't think we've mentioned at all which is super important and is in the in the zine is just like we've been talking about like talking on online with like apps and stuff but like you can talk face to face outside away from a camera, away from electronics. Like if you need to have a secure conversation that has to be secure or private, that's the way to do it. Like do it face to face, like go for a walk. That's the final word. Thanks for listening to our interview with the author of The Pet Guide. The zine can be found on It's Going Down by searching New Communication Infrastructure for Anarchists. And the author can be reached at pettingzoo at riseup.net. From Embers is a weekly radio show of anarchist ideas and practice, airing on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on CFRC 101.9 FM in Kingston, Ontario. You can also subscribe to our podcast by searching From Embers in your favorite app or visiting fromembers.libsyn.com. We always want to hear what you think, so shoot us an email at fromembers at riseup.net. See you next time.
Get ready for the most action-packed podcast. We continue fighting because we hate all authority and love freedom, which cannot be given, but must be taken. Such scenes as, this is not a dialogue, a crime called freedom, parties over, and many, many more. For more text and audio material of interest to anarchists, check out ResonanceAudioDistro.org.